Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind. where the idea has been to turn us into left brain prisoners. Uh, even conventional science accepts that the left brain is where we get intellect, logic, physical worldview. Can I touch it, taste it, smell it? Okay, it must exist. In the right brain, you have the bigger picture, the connection with the cosmos. That's where the artist, the inspiration, the creativity comes from. And if you look at the institutions of education, of science, and all these different areas of um, information, the media too, they're pumping information of a left brain variety and suppressing this. So you get a situation where um, what we call education works like this. Information is pumped into the left brain, most of it completely rubbish. And what people are asked to do, students are asked to do, is to hold that information there and then when they get an exam paper in front of them, to regurgitate that onto the paper. If they remember it and put it there well enough and repeat what they've been told, they pass the exam and progress. If they take that information in the left brain, transfer it to the right and start filtering it and questioning it, and saying, well, does it make sense, what do I think about this, and then tell the exam paper, oh, actually it's a piece of shit, this stuff then they don't pass the exam and they don't progress. The education system is completely built to create left brain prisoners who are basically sponges of the official version of life. And if you're a scientist, for instance, you go through that and then you go to, to your speciality in science and you get more left brain information. Same with doctors and all these professions. They're left brain prisoners who cannot conceive so much of what I've been talking about here because they're imprisoned in the intellect. We can just balance those two sides of the brain, the intellect and the spirit, the mind and the heart, then suddenly um, we are transformed in terms of our perception of ourselves. Well, this is a symbol that um, kind of encapsulates, I think, uh, how we are disconnected from, from who we really are and the process that so many people are going through now to remove that division so we can reconnect. What you're looking at there symbolically is the I call it lower vibrational emotional range. It's the range of frequency that resonates the energy within us to fear, to guilt, to resentment, to lack of self-esteem. And the more that we are manipulated to feel those things and the more we manipulate each other to feel those things, uh, the more what I call that cesspit vibration of low vibrational emotion gets more and more full and more difficult to get through and therefore out to the multidimensional state that we can get into as we reconnect with the ocean, with the, the cosmos. And this is why when people start on this spiritual journey, my goodness me, I was there myself um, over the last uh, 10 years or so, the reason that they start to realize when they start to walk the journey that all hell breaks loose in their life, that structures break down in their life and they think, crikey, if this is spiritual. I remember me, when I started on this route, um, my life broke down in so many ways, I thought, if this is spirituality, you can stuff it. I don't want to know. But why is this happening? Why, why does this happen to people? Because, as I mentioned earlier, when you put out your intent, this is what I want to achieve, that intent energy will always draw towards us what we need to achieve that intent. Let me tell you why you're here. You're here because you know something. What you know you can't explain, but you feel it. You felt it your entire life, that there's something wrong with the world. You don't know what it is, but it's there, like a splinter in your mind, driving you. You're born into the world, you, you, most people are born into left brain families. Mm -hmm. That's not a criticism. Most, most people in the world are left brain families. Why? Because that's what the system wants them to be and, 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 and manipulates them to be. So the child comes up, 
uh, and gets brought up in a left brain kind of uh, uh, situation, then goes to school and teachers talk to the child's left brain through um, school, through college, through university. And then um, in exams, they, they say, okay, now what we want you to do in effect is take all that information out the left brain, put it on a paper. If you do that really well, then you'll pass the exam. And then, what do you want to be, a scientist, you, a doctor, you, or, or whatever. Okay, well, now you specialize, and you go through the same process again, specialization. So a doctor goes through medical school, and what he says in his exams, and uh, of various kinds, practical uh, and, and, and written, is, is what he's been told is the truth, not necessarily the truth. In fact, almost... Uh, uh, definitely most of the time not and he has to repeat that version of truth to become a doctor it doesn't become one same with scientists and stuff and then he has to practice when doctors say I'm in practice I think well you know I, I want to see a doctor who's already got it right thanks who's still not practicing you know but anyway the um, uh, the, the doctor then has to practice in line with the alleged truth, otherwise he gets struck off, or he or she gets struck off. And therefore, what you've got in all these fundamental institutions that dictate our society and, and what we should believe is possible, impossible, real and not real, are all virtually left brain prisoners. And so this is where the resistance comes from doctors and mainstream scientists to, to moving into another view of reality, A, because it puts their own job and livelihood under threat if they go too far, um, and also because there are many psychological things that go on, like they have to start accepting that all that they've been taught to believe and all that they've believed and all the treatments they've been given, or many of them, simply are not only not the truth, but actually are very detrimental to the patient. So all this has to be absorbed and processed before they can, they can start to move out and, and, and look at the world in a completely different way. The fact that more and more of them are shows just how powerful this energetic information change is, new epoch change is uh, in its effect on, on more and more people. You know, I, I, I look at uh, people who have started to, to look at this in a different way, and I think, God, two years ago, I'd have said, you, no chance, but that they, 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 they have. And we're going to be shocked in the, in the years to come, the next few years, at the people that are going to, the, the waters are going to break, and they're going to um, open their uh, awareness to a, a very, very different um, perception of themselves and being targeted um, um, more than ever before be to suppress this potential they have to um, start to awaken to much higher levels of awareness much earlier in life than, than, than they are, you know, those of us who came in a few decades ago. Uh, it's all syst systematic, it's all coldly calculated, but there's a this, this thing here. Nothing can overwhelm consciousness in awareness of itself. And uh, there are, uh, one of the great uh, things is to um, go around the world and, and, and meet young people who in recent times have been through this trash of a system designed to uh, uh, put them to sleep, to... Uh, distort their sense of reality, to distort the balance of their mental, emotional and physical, so what we call physical state. And yet, there they are, awake, got it. And uh, so the system is um, uh, whistling in the dark, um, trying desperately to hold on to its uh, epoch of control, an epoch that's, that's dying as we look at it. So. Uh, it can it can make things more difficult. You can't stop what's coming. It can't. Yeah, I, I suppose the the way is to make the parents more aware of what they give their kids to eat, and um, get them to get dedicate uh, part of their day to to leisure, 
to relaxation. We're finding these kids coming out of school like robots. They, they in, in Spain, they, they come out quite late. At five o'clock is, is the time. What time do they start? They start at nine. You are joking. Yeah, five o'clock. And then if they do extracurricular activities, like my own daughter, they're coming out of school at six, 6.30. Um, and then they get home and they're expected to sit behind a table under artificial light and do homework for hours and hours. I have said so. all my life, the first sane decision any education system can make is ban homework. Yes. If you can't tell children what they need to know when you've got them for those hours every day, five days a week, then get another bloody job then. Yeah. The idea of homework is ludicrous. I, I, you know what we're looking at, yeah. right? This is what, this is the perception change that, that, that that so many people, I think, need to look at so that they can be aware of their own situation. They, th they think they're free, right? So let's look at the freedom of incredible amounts of people, even in the Western world. They get up in the morning. They have to get up at a certain time because they've got to go to work. Why have they got to go to work? Because the system has made um, their basic needs in life dependent on earning money. Figures on a screen, uh, that, are, uh, that, that are created out of nothing by banks and then we pay interest on them, figures out of nothing. And if we don't meet the payments because we lose our job because the banks have crashed the bloody economic system, the banks throw us out of our home. Hey, we're free, honey. Um, and then they get in a car and they drive to work. And I've driven into Los Angeles with people um, 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 every day for one week and they were almost orgasmic when the traffic jam didn't start for another mile down the freeway <laughs> that it normally does, right? <laughs> and you sit there, and, and, and you get to work and you're tired, you have to get to work at a certain time, and then you're in prison all day because you have to do what you're told to do, you have to keep the bosses happy, you can't leave until a certain time, right? Then that's when they give you parole for the evening. And then you get in your car and you drive back and you, you're in the traffic jams on the way home. You get home, you're tired, you're frustrated, you're stressed. And then uh, you have your tea. Then you watch the goggle box, the oblong hypnotist in the corner of the room. The television. And it tells you what to believe about the world and reality and it overwhelming yourself. And then you go to bed. You take a sleeping pill maybe because... You're so stressed you can't sleep. Oh, doctor, I can't sleep. Why is it? Because you're stressed. Why are you stressed? Look at your lifestyle, mate. And then you get up in the morning and you get in your car. It all starts again. Oh, uh, he's free. He's got a good job. He has well. Uh, all right. Now, another part of this daily uh, ritual is you come home, usually late, so you spend very little time with your children. And your children, they've just come back from prison. Because they left in the morning, yeah. about the same time you did, and they go to their prison called a school. They have to be there at a certain time. They then have to be told what to do and, and do as they're told all day yes. while they're told what to believe, lesson after lesson after lesson, yes. by teachers who've been through exactly the same process as the, the children are going through, and now they are programmed to program the next generation. Um, then um, they, uh, they leave school, um, they get parole for the evening, um, when the school says you can leave. And they then take home uh, homework, so that when they, the little leisure time they might have, um, they um, are, are, as you say, sitting there doing homework. Now what is this doing? All I have not described yet, in, in the day of the children and the day of the, the parents, if you like, one thing that involved the right brain being accessed, it's all left brain stuff. And what is the greatest thing to open the left brain of a child? Play. 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 Creativity. Imagination. Ad-libbing. Spontaneity. Ad-libbing. Imagination. Play and, and all the rest of it. And what they're doing, not least in Britain now, they're trying to squeeze that point from birth to the first academic uh, type um, lessons, they're trying to squeeze that period mm -hmm. smaller and smaller and smaller. And I heard Obama uh, last year, you know, this, uh, this, this, this amazing intellect who can read words off a teleprompter, <laughs> but he's a stuttering idiot whenever <laughs> it goes down.
<laughs> and he said to meet the challenge of uh, meet the meet the challenge of, of of the global economy. Now meet the challenge of the global economy. Where did the global economy come from? That's challenging us to 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 more work and more more education for the very uh, people that are. Uh, imposing this education and stuff upon us, and he said um, that children should should spend more time at school, oh. and, and they should uh, reduce the, the the period in the summer when they they have a, a, a break from school to do what to play and ad lib and open the right brain. Um, so it's all systematic, uh, uh, and this is why um, I, I focus so much on the nature of reality. Uh, and how we interact with it, because when we understand the themes of that, the way the system's structured is, it's like an open book. Yeah. It's structured to shut us down and and stop us being the the, the incredible awareness consciousness that we really are. Yeah, they're, they're keeping us on mind mode. We have to think. We have to plan tomorrow. We're, they're getting us out of the present. Because I, I know what when you say like. Kids are playing, they're happy, they're free, they're inspired. And you can only get inspired, which we call in spirit, when you're out of your mind. So yeah. when do these kids actually have time to play and be free? Because uh, we know that we're tired as parents when we arrive home, the kids are tired. And that's just, exactly. who wants to do homework at 6 or 7 o'clock in the evening, you know, and do, yeah, the kids get cranky. And then that upsets mum and dad, and then it's just creating conflict in the family. Okay. So then all hell Absolutely. Uh, gets loose, yeah? So, kids, don't do homework. Nothing. Okay? No homework. No Forget homework. <laughs> okay, let's have a revolution. No homework. <laughs> if you can't tell us what you say we need to know, I don't necessarily agree with you, in fact, I don't. Between like, what did you say in Spain? Nine o'clock till From five. Nine o'clock to five minimum. And then homework. And at the weekends as well. Homework well, at the weekends. Thing is, the thing is, what are we looking at? It's not. I'm going from home to school, is it? No. It's. It's every now and again. I'm going from school to home. That's the relationship. No more homework. Tell them to stick it. Come on, revolution. Good bloody god! I mean, crikey, we 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 we're trying it. We're trying to. Bring our children up to be the full magnitude of who they are, and every day we say goodbye, darling, and they go off to be uh, 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 suppressed uh, uh, in terms of the magnitude of who they are. Come on, we've had enough of this. I when you flow with your intuitive knowing, you're flowing with the flow of um, synchronicity, where things just appear as you need them and want them and, and or whatever. And what happens with the mind, which is which is programmed by the the goggle box, the television, and the the, the uh, education, and all the rest of it? It sees everything in terms of uh, limitation, uh, conformity, acquiescence, and thus it's constantly trying to stop you following this intuitive flow. So once you say, "Okay, you have your say," fine, I've listened, I'm going anyway. Then you start to break the stranglehold on our perceptions of 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 low limited mind over uh, infinite consciousness because we don't have to seek enlightenment. We are all enlightened. That's our natural state. What we need to do is remove the programmed barriers of vibrational layers of the onion, if you like, mm -hmm. that um, stop the conscious mind um, being aware of its um, higher levels of awareness. Uh, and once that happens, your life changes. Yes. No more uh, little me, no more on my knees to anybody. That all changes when your mind gets up. Well, <laughs> World wars change worlds, and if you have a global agenda, then global problems allow you to offer global solutions. And if you look how the world was transformed by the First World War and the Second World War, the world was a completely different place after both of those wars. And the idea all along has been to have a Third World War to complete the transformation. 
into a global state with a world government and a world army um, dictating to the global population. And there was a, a letter, a, a controversial letter, because uh, people uh, d dismiss it, but with the passage of events, it becomes more and more credible. And it was a letter written by a man called Albert Pike, who was a massive, massive Freemason in um, the United States in the 19th century. And it was to uh, uh, another Illuminati infamous character called Mazzini, Giuseppe Mazzini. And it detailed three world wars that would transform global society. And uh, the first one described it in the terms that happened. Uh, the second one it described in terms that, that it happened. But, uh, you know, you can say, well, it came to light later. So, you know, maybe they just put that in and fake the accuracy of the first two wars. So th the credibility of what it said lies in what it said about the Third World War. And it talked about creating a conflict between the Muslim world and what it called political Zionism. And people will say, well, that's got to be a fake because there was no Zionism when that letter was supposed to be written. Well, this is an agenda that's projected a long way forward. This is why uh, Aldous Huxley, Brave New World, and um, Eric Blair, George Orwell, um, 1984, who knew each other, Huxley uh, taught um, George Orwell uh, French at Eton College, where the royals go, and they knew each other and, and they became friends. And from the same sources, not least the Fabian Society in Britain, they uh, understood the projected agenda. And we're talking there in uh, 1932 that Huxley's book was published, 1948 that uh, Orwell's book was published, and, and, and they are um, describing the society that's unfolding today at that time. And there are many, many other examples of people predicting the future who were insiders, who, who tur have turned out to be incredibly accurate. Um, so the idea that um, Albert Pike would know that this Zionist movement was coming and the, 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 the establishment of Israel was coming um, is very credible when you look at the, the, the background evidence. And of course, Zionism was established not that long after this letter was supposed to be written. And so he was talking about the Muslim world being brought into a war with the um, political Zionism, what today we call Israel, and that this would, you know, in my terms, create a vortex that would draw in the world, um, in, in, in our terms, America, the European Union, NATO, uh, into, uh, into this war. And what you uh, have um, now is a situation that this ISIS group has come out of nowhere, in effect, incredibly well armed, um, incredibly funded. I mean, I've seen figures like two billion dollars at its disposal. And it's walking into, into towns um, in, 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 um, in Iraq and taking them over. It's established itself at the key border crossings into Syria and into uh, Jordan. And it's all happened really fast. And what um, the potential of this uh, clearly is, is to do what um, Pike was talking about. Because I've said in my books for years that the plan was to create a massive divide and rule conflict between the Shia Muslims and the Sunni Muslims. I mean, I, I know it's hard to believe for anyone frickin' sane, but it, this argument over, uh, this ancient argument over who, who should, you know, be the natural successor to the rightful successor to Muhammad and all that stuff has created this this enormous schism which, and schisms are there to be manipulated and uh, and uh, exploited by these people so what you have therefore is this Isis that suddenly appeared with its grotesque violence that is representing Sunni Muslims and then you have the uh, regime currently in Iraq that is representing, in effect, Shia Muslims, and you have, just across the border, um, the center of 
the Shia Muslim world, and that's Iran. Iran, 89%, um, I think it is, of Iranian Muslims are Shia. Now, in the last little while, there's been this, apparently on the, the face of it, this strange um, change of, of uh, um, direction by America in terms of Iran. They've spent all these years um, with Israel saying, well, you know, we must uh, take out their, their nuclear facilities and these sanctions against them and all, oh, they're terrible. And now, if you remember, in the last uh, week or so, they've even been talking about maybe they ought to get into discussions with Iran and come to some agreement on how they deal with this ISIS situation. Um, and, and it's like, what? Yeah. But when you come from this perspective, what they're doing is they're trying to draw Iran into this Sunni um, Shia conflict, like, you know, protect the Shia that this, this Sunni ISIS are, 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 are threatening and, and, and um, overrunning at the moment. And once they get Iran pulled into that vortex, it ain't going to get out. Yeah. Then there's another aspect of this, which is a real red flag for me. And that is this ISIS organization um, is ex very extreme and its very name, when you break, break down the, the wording, um, is describing its ambitions and that's to take over Iraq, to take over Syria and to take over what they call the Levant. And what does the Levant include? Israel. So here you have this extreme um, Muslim group uh, or actually uh, the army, um, actually saying in its own name that our intention is to take over the, 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 the Levant, to take over Israel. And you'd think at any other time, even with a lesser situation, Netanyahu would be surrounded by microphones and he'd be saying, we must be protected, Israel is in danger. Instead, he's come out and said, oh, no, no problem, you leave them to it. America, no, don't intervene, leave them to it, let them, let them, let them basically weaken each other. And then you've got the United States, their reaction. Um, I mean, it sums up the, the ludicrous nature of it, that John Kerry has gone to Iraq and he said, well, we don't know about bloody airstrikes because, you know, we might kill civilians. Well, that's never stopped you in the past, mate, has it? or any of your predecessors. And what, what it seems to me as I'm reading this is that they're all standing off to let this ISIS um, get um, a big foothold in that region. And then if it, if it moves to the point where it starts to threaten Israel, then the button will be pressed, then the uh, Americans and NATO will come in because they're committed to protecting Israel's security. And, and then you'll start to see why um, that sliver of land called Israel, with less than 8 million people, has one of the best equipped armies in the world and a nuclear arsenal. Because what Pike was talking about was drawing all these different disparate groups in and creating this, this, this vortex of mutual self-destruction which would change the, uh, the war that would change the world taking on from the previous world wars that changed the world and then at that point their global um, fascist society would be brought in. No doubt justified by we need a world government and we need a world army to stop this ever happening again even though we who are saying that actually created it. And then you've got what I've been saying now way back in the 1990s. The idea is for this third world war to involve Russia and China against the West. Yeah. Oceania versus Eurasia. Yeah, yeah the, the 1984 kind of uh, scenario. And uh, what you um, have now is the demonization of Russia. Have you noticed that? How suddenly the, the, we got the demonize, demonization of Russia. And what's um, opening up um, in the Ukraine, while all this is starting to go on in the Middle East, is, is another front against Russia. Because, you know, it's very easy to see how Russia can be uh, pulled in to this Middle Eastern uh, conflict by supporting Syria, because destroying Syria is, is, is part of ISIS's agenda and American agenda and, and NATO's agenda. And also Iran as well. 
Yeah, and destroying Iran. Yeah, so um, uh, and, and and Russia would come out in support of Iran, and and I, the, the same would happen with China. Um, and so you can see how it's how how the the pieces in the in the uh, in the game are being moved around to um, create the scenario that Pike talked about. A, a close um, aide uh, of uh, President Putin, uh, who, ha who has uh, special responsibility for Ukraine, has actually said this week um, that the United States is preparing for um, a war against Russia through Ukraine, and that what they plan is to try to take Crimea back. Mm. Now, um, you can have the odd bit of terrorism and, and bad things happen in Ukraine to Russian supporting people and Putin can stay back and um, hold his fire because he knows what they're trying to manipulate him into. But if they try to take Crimea back, Putin's ego and Putin's pride will no way I, I would strongly suspect, um, allow him just to let them do it. Exactly. And, and therefore, that if they try to tra take Crimea back, uh, then what you're looking at is a war, uh, or a calculated war against Russia. Yeah. And if you, if you start um, a, a front against Russia on its borders, and then all this stuff going on in the Middle East, you are, you are diluting Russia's impact on what's happening in the Middle East. Yeah. And uh, it, it's 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 all it's all it's all a setup. Um, and when you have Saudi Arabia and Qatar, who are 51st states of the United States, there are, there are many of those, mind, uh, funding this ISIS and funding this terrorism, while the Americans, who could tell them to stop any time, are saying uh, are, are, are condemning the very terrorism that their 51st states are supporting. Well, the picture is so bloody obvious. It's a setup, yeah. and it's a setup to um, attempt to trigger World War III. Welcome to Bovis TV. I'm sitting here with David Eich and this is, I think, my sec second interview. I was at your place at, was it 2007 or something? And a yeah. lot of things have um, happened since then. But we have to start from the beginning, so to say, for the audience who don't okay. know you. David Eich, uh, most people know you, but not everyone. And we have to, for starters, we need to. Uh, talk about what you are associated most with, that is the reptilian um, agenda and that we are divine beings but we are manipulated from beings that are not from here or what uh, uh, and that they are actually the royal family, the British royal family is involved with reptilian beings. How, how does it work? Crikey, on you go. Um, it's uh something that I've been well researching is um, is, is a hardly applicable word in some ways because to research means to look for and you do do that of course you do but after some extraordinary um, uh, what people would call paranormal experiences in 1990 and 91 um, my life has become, since then, this synchronistic series of coincidences um, which have led me to, and even brought to me, really, um, people, personal experiences, documents, books, and all these different sources um, that have put information before me in a very coordinated way, like some hidden hand is passing information to you. And it's not just 
random information. It's information that very clearly, as it comes into my life, has a, a direction. It has a, um, a series of steps. So in the early 1990s, the information that was coming into my life was about the fact that there was a, a cobal that was manipulating uh, human society and world events towards the goal of a Orwellian global state mm. in which um, there would be a, a world government dictating to every country. Countries would be dismantled and become regions of great power structures. The European Union is a classic. Um, and what we're seeing now with the European Union is the next stage of breaking countries up by destroying them financially and then um, centrally dictating financially and, and in terms of government. Um, and that there was a plan for a global army to impose the will of the world government, uh, a world central bank to impose um, the cabal's um, global financial structure and uh, control, and that the plan was for um, every child at birth to be microchipped as a matter of course. Now that was kind of whoa enough um, as the information came and of course with the passage of the years this has been confirmed more and more by the fact that it's happening. Um, then there was a phase uh, in the mid to late 1990s when while that other information continued and has continued to this present day another if you like parallel and connected series of synchronistic um, situations happened in my life which brought information to me and this mm. related to the fact that the network of families which go back to the ancient world that are behind this control system I've just described and, and its ambitions mm. actually take a non-human form a, a, a not just reptilian though that seems to be the dominant one but and I uh, moved on from that too and gone into other levels of it beyond that uh, but that there is a non-human force um, behind this uh, attempt to lock down the world and then from about 2002-2003 right to the present day all these continue once they come in, into my life these different areas they continue together that's why I work 12-15 hours a day mm. keeping up with it but this third phase from about 2000-2003 was the most important because without this you can't really understand the rest and that was about the nature of reality, the illusory nature of what we call physical reality, the fact that solidity is delusional and that we live in a holographic illusory physical reality which is only one level of many multi-levels of this reality which operates on a waveform uh, uh, level, vibrational level, it operates on an electrical level, it operates on a digital level and operates on the holographic level which we in the conscious mind perceive as, as the world. And to appreciate that when I look through my eyes, another illusion funnily enough, which is why when people have near-death experiences they leave the body and they're looking down on the body with the eyes but they're still seeing <laughs> so I mean the, the, the scale of illusion in our so-called physical experience is is extraordinary I mean and we've not got to the bottom of it yet but um, it is that when I look through my eyes shall we say that um, people think that they're, they're seeing everything there is to see in the space that I'm looking at they're, no they're not they're seeing a tiny band of frequency called visible light, which is so tiny, mm -hmm. it is ludicrous. Um, and the rest of uh, what exists in this universe, and even mainstream science would say this, although it's Stone Age science, I would suggest, but even it sees this, that the overwhelming vast majority of what exists in this universe, in energy, matter, mass, whatever you want to call it, its different forms, we cannot see. And therefore, we are 
living, if you like, in like a, a holographic television channel. Mm -hmm. So all I'm seeing now as I look here is this tiny frequency range called visible light. Channel, channel one. Yeah, but all the other um, levels of reality also share the same space as the one that we're experiencing. And, you know, we've got digital television coming in now and all that stuff, but um, if you take the analog version of television, uh, radio too, mm. um, they are sharing the same space without interfering with each other but because they're on different frequencies and thus interpenetrating this reality that we experience um, with a conscious mind it are all the other realities where very very different worlds are manifest and with very different uh, what we call laws of physics and so it's from these frequencies that are very, very close to this one uh, that we use the term with radio and television um, where interference takes place. Um, and if you have two radio stations that are well away from each other in the frequency band, then they don't interfere with each other. You, one's not aware of the other one. But you get two frequencies that are, are, are close, and you can get, you might, it might be dominated by one, but there's interference from the other. Mm. Why? Because the frequencies are very close. Well, these um, manipulating entities, forces, shall we say, um, operate from a frequency band that's very close to this one, but not this one. So but they might not see them, that, but, but they might yeah. be here. Well, let, let, let's give an example. You'll see stories um, of UFOs appearing out of nowhere and disappearing into nowhere. You'll hear stories about uh, people saying this entity appeared out of nowhere and disappeared into nowhere. Well, they haven't disappeared. Mm -hmm. what, uh, and they haven't appeared out of nowhere. What they've done is they've entered the frequency band that we can decode, um, the, the visible light frequency band that I'm talking about, and when it enters that, we start decoding that information because it's now in our ability to do that. And as we start decoding it, bang, to the, to the observer, it appears that it's just come out of nowhere. And then it leaves that frequency range and to the observer, it's disappeared into nowhere. It hasn't. It's just left that band that we can decode, which is tiny. And so when you... And I find this particularly compelling... Um, when I go around different ancient beliefs and explanations of what's happening, and you find that although they're using different names, they're telling the same story. Mm. Uh, for instance, um, there was a, a group of people, or a, a, shall we say a belief system, which goes back hundreds of years and has become known as Gnostic. This was the belief system of people that ran the, the, the great library of Alexandria um, with uh, Hypatia who was slaughtered by a mob inspired by the Roman church because um, that library carried information and knowledge that would have, as it circulated, um, demolished the Roman church's version of everything and um, it was challenging the Roman church version of everything. And what's interesting is whenever you come across the Gnostics belief system expressing itself, um, you, you see it's followed by slaughter, suppression, and the destruction of that knowledge. <laughs> so um, the Cathars in southern France um, were Gnostics in terms of their belief system. Um, we'll go into what that belief system is in a second. Uh, and so, again, in went the church and uh, all these, you know, people that kill for the church and they destroyed the Cathars. It's, I think, uh, 1244, was it, was the, the, the last stand to the, the mountain fortress at Montségur in southern France in the foothills of the Pyrenees. Um, 
And again, it's not just we slaughter, we slaughter them, but we destroy their knowledge. But, but a, a fantastic thing happened in 1945 when um, a sealed jar of Gnostic writings, quite considerable writings, was found um, by a peasant in Egypt in 1945. And they describe much of the Gnostic belief system. Now, key in my interest, one of the things, of course, as a quick aside, they were telling a very different version of the Christian story. Um, and um, we might get into that because it, it's relevant. But the, the key thing for me was that around a fifth of these texts were about a phenomenon they called the Archons. And the Archons, um, these Gnostics said, were a manipulative force that operated outside of human sight that was basically, as we would call it, an, a, a, an energetic form rather than what we would call a physical form, though it could manifest as physical form through holographic projections and stuff. They even, and, and these writings even talked in their own way about the illusory nature of this reality. Um, and they talked about the, the archons were the, uh, if you like, the like cyborg, we would call it, mm -hmm. troops mm -hmm. of something they call the demiurge. Mm -hmm. And the demiurge is what Christians call the devil and, and this negative force. And what uh, these writings said is that this reality that we're experiencing was not created by some divine force. It was created by the demiurge and the archons and it was a fake reality. And that they manipulated by accessing the human psyche and manipulating humans' perception of reality. And there was very, some very, very interesting things that they said about the archons. And one was that they lacked the ability to express the creative force. I would put it like this. If you gave them a blank sheet of paper and said create something like a reality, they couldn't do it. Mm. But what um, the Gnostic writings say is they're experts at taking something that already exists, like the reality before this uh, hijack, as I would call it, the one we experience now, and twist it. Mm -hmm. They piggyback something already created and twist it. Something else they said the archons did. And, you know, you're going back to something that's been estimated, I think, around 400 AD, these writings were buried. Mm -hmm. um, and that is that the archons parasite off everything. They parasite off human um, society in many, many different forms. And I read this stuff and, and I'm going, whoa, this is my own uh, books over the years, um, found in a jar <laughs> in Egypt. Okay. Um, not all the detail of my books, but the basic themes, because it fitted totally. And then you go to the Islamic belief. And not just the Islamic belief, because this, this came from pre-Islamic Arabia originally. And that is the, the very considerable focus in Islam on energetic beings they call the jinn. Mm -hmm. And when you look at the jinn and you look at what the Gnostics said about the archons, hallelujah, hello, they're the same thing. And then you go around other cultures and you see the same recurring theme. And um, so when you look then at human society, um, who creates, what is the creative force 
within human society? Humans. Should be. Mm -hmm. What do the um, what do these families that I've been exposing all these years? What do they do? They piggyback off that creative force and manipulate it and direct it in a way that suits them. What do these network of families also do? They parasite off human effort, human labor, human energy, human creativity. The banking system, I rest my case. What is the global banking system except a parasite. structure um, totally uh, focused on parasiting the energy uh, and off the efforts of the human population? What is taxation in the way that it is today? It is parasiting of human efforts and human creativity. So what I also found interesting is that the archons are, are described, as, as we would say, like cyborgs. They almost like they're computer like. Mm -hmm. And they serve this, this force they call the Demiurge. Well, I've been talking about these reptilian entities that operate outside human sight, but can come in, and, mm -hmm. and the Archons can, but they can't stay for long because of the, the frequency difference. They can come in for a while, but it takes so much energy to, to stay in our reality because it's not their natural frequency band that they, mm -hmm. they can't stay for long. And what they've done, just a quick aside before I continue that thing about the reptilians, what they've done is they have created a network of bloodline families going way back to the ancient world which represent their interests with invisible light because they can't come here and stay for very long so these families where their outer human form if you like is operating within the frequency band of visible light mm. they are the archon representatives within human society and this is why you get this network of um, families that sit on top of the banking system, the transnational corporation network, uh, the media ownership level, uh, top of science, top of the education uh, system, top of the military, top of the in in global intelligence network. These are these families representing what the Gnostics call the Archons. And I was going to say a few minutes ago, um, when you look at how these archons are described, they're just like the reptilians that I've been writing about for years in terms of their um, computer-like um, structured to the point of obsession uh, society, which absolutely knows its hierarchical place every level knows its hierarchical place in it and it's very um, robot-like and computer-like uh, it's not a flowing creative force it's very structured boom, boom. and that's how the archons are described and they have no compassion, no yes, yes. I mean, empathy. I, 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 the only one time I've taken psychoactive drugs in my life was in 2003 in a rainforest in Brazil when I took a, a rainforest potion called ayahuasca. And I went into, I, I had an amazing time, some people had a bad time on it. And mm. for five hours, this voice, so strong when I went into an altered state of um, perception, talked to me so loud, loudly and so powerful about the illusory nature of reality for five hours and when I came back and because I had instant memory of all of it uh, when I came back and uh, checked it all out you could see very quickly that mainstream science in all its different disciplines has, has, has shown that what I was told that night is true but because the disciplines are kept apart and a and, and mm. war with each other for funding and, 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 and precedence that the, the, the dots never get put together because they're not mm. meant to. They, we're not supposed to know what reality we are experiencing. It gives us too much power once we know. Um, and this voice said to me at one point about
about when it's talking about the computer-like nature of these manipulators. If you programmed a computer to abuse a child, would the would the computer have any problem with it? No. Why? Because it would just um, decode the data and act in line with the data, the software program. And these, uh, this reptilian force um, is very much like that, very uh, structured, very predictable. And interestingly, um, because most people don't realize this, but one of the most important parts of the human brain in terms of human behavior and response and reaction to situations is called the reptilian brain or the R complex. Mm. And when you look at the traits of the reptilian brain within the human brain, of course other parts of the brain are balanced that out or should do, but when you have more reptilian genetics, those traits of the reptilian brain are obviously more extreme and more, more pronounced. And one of the, the, this is mainstream science, um, one of the key traits of the reptilian brain is obsessive ritualistic behavior. Mm. And what is ritualistic behavior? It's following the same pattern, um, you know, day after day, week after week, repeating repetitious behavior. Now, this is robotic. Uh, and, and so you've got the, uh, the reptilians described in that, those terms, the archons described in those terms, etc. And these forces are, are different uh, expressions and names for the same thing. Now, one of the manifestations of this network of bloodlines that represent this archonic reptilian force within human society uh, is the royal f families going back to the ancient world and the aristocratic families that, that, that surround them. Why? Because where did the idea that certain bloodlines should be king or queen of a, of a, of a, of a people, uh, and you have these, this hierarchy, because this is the thing, other thing about reptilian genetics and the reptilian brain, it's obsessed with hierarchical structures of power. Look at our world. Yeah. Look at the royal families and the aristocracy. It's absolutely rigid with hierarchy. Everyone knows their place. You're a viscount, you're a baron, you're a lord, you're a king, you're a prince, and all this stuff. Yeah. This is the human expression uh, of the partly human expression, because they're hybrids, um, of the uh, reptilian archon obsession with hierarchical structure manifested in our world. Because what they've done, it, they're doing, is bringing that archonic reptilian reality into our world and making our world like theirs, more and more and more. Now, we have this thing, of course, going way back, which goes under the title of things like the divine right to rule. And what is that? That's the right to rule because of your bloodline, because of your DNA. And we have the ancient emperors of um, China claiming the right to be the ruler because of their uh, descendants from the serpent gods. <laughs> and the, the, the association between the serpent and the snake with royalty and royal families and royal bloodlines, just follow it back. And so, um, you look at these royal bloodlines that have come through, because what happened is that uh, there came a time when the human population started to reject overt, in-your-face dictatorship from royal bloodline. And that you had that move where this force, not entirely, not least in Britain, um, moved um, into what I call the dark suit professions of banking and business and, and all the rest of it, and, and, and politics, and, and have gone on manipulating from, from that point of view. But some of them survived, like the British royal family. 
Now, if you want to see a group of people that are so obsessed to the extreme, not just with hierarchy, but my goodness me, they are. The whole British class system, as they call it, is based on, obviously, hierarchy, which is based on the head of state being the queen. But you want to see a group of people who are obsessed with ritualistic behaviour, look at the royal family. Mm. She goes to the same palace uh, at Christmas. She goes to the same palace uh, um, in um, the summer. She goes uh, to the same palace in the spring and so on. And, and, you, and if you look at um, the royal year, it's ritualistic. It's a hamster's wheel. Repeating, repeating, repeating. And then, and we've seen in the week that we're talking, um, 60 years, the Queen 60th, Elizabeth, yes. uh, yeah, uh, Anniversary. year on the throne, the, the Diamond Jubilee, mm. it's really been in our face in the last few days, and I've watched as much as I can because I wanted to follow the ritual. But, you know, Britain is famous for what is called pomp and ceremony. Mm. You know, the, 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 the guards in red jackets and black hats, you know, like, you know, need a haircut, <laughs> um, uh, marching up, changing of the guard, and then you've got people in breeches and, and, and all this stuff. It's unbelievable. But it's not pomp and ceremony. It is ritual. ritual. Repeating ritual. So if, you know, I'm saying... And I've said for years and years and years, I've been saying it this week, um, mm. as this has unfolded, that the British royal family, and the royal families of Europe too, but the British royal family is a, an expression of this hybrid bloodline which represents these other dimensional forces within human society. And I've described how these other dimensional forces operate, their mentality, how they stress structured and you look at the British royal family alone and it's absolutely a mirror of the very traits that the Gnostics etc have spoken of in terms of this uh, arconic other dimensional force you know it's very challenging obviously for people that have not researched this and and not been through the experiences that I've been through in terms of things that I've seen and things that I've experienced and things that I've, I've, I've read and researched. And also because from cradle to grave we are given a certain version of reality. Boom! Mm. You know, education system, peer pressure, media, all the way through to actually go and encompass the possibility of what I'm saying. But you know, it's like Gandhi said, even if you're in a minority of one, and I'm not anymore, far from it, mm. but even if you're in a minority of one, the truth is still the truth. And it's not, it doesn't become an untruth because people can't find the capacity to see it's possible. It's just, you know, people say, um, that's impossible, uh, that can't be done, that's crazy. But what are they doing? They're just looking at something from a certain point of observation. And if their point of observation has been just to take in the programming that's imposed upon us from the first moment we become conscious in this reality, then they'll see it in a certain way and they'll say, that's crazy. But if you spend 22 years researching it, you're looking at it from a completely different obs point of observation, and to you, it's blatantly bloody obvious. Uh, and it's bringing those two points of view together that's the challenge, because they're... what is happening in the world, and, and, and what's behind what is happening in the world, is so massively different, fundamentally almost indescribably different to what we're told is happening, that that's the chasm, that is probably more than anything else the greatest defence uh, vehicle that this conspiracy has. It is so extraordinary that people...
think it's not possible and anyone that talks about it must be crazy. But it is changing. All right. On the other hand, I just uh, wanted to ask that uh, people waking up and uh, people are coming to your lectures now to the thousands, thousands and you have full halls and you want to do a big uh, event in the Wembley um, Arena with, with probably thousands of uh, people. Um, so it's important if you know all these things that they are pretty frightening, that we are being manipulated for thousands of years. How do, on the other hand, we are divine consciousness, you said, and uh, we, we, we just have to change our perception. What can we do now that we know that we are being manipulated? How do we get out of it and can we get out of it? Well, you have to go deep in the rabbit hole for this. And of course, you constantly going deeper or trying to go deeper. Um, but see, there are many aspects to this. When, um, again, you scan the ancient world, including texts that came through to be things like Genesis and the Bible, there is another common theme. And that is that there was an interbreeding I'm sure it was direct interbreeding, but interbreeding. There was, a, there was genetic manipulation mm. of the human form. And this is my view after 22 years of researching this and the information coming to me. Before this force hijacked our reality, Humans were very different, and it's so different, I won't call them humans, I'll call them earth people. Mm -hmm. um, and they were a heart-censored society, in the sense that, you know, we have this holographic body, and interpenetrating all the different levels of the human form, energetic and holographic are vortexes that have become known as chakras, uh, wheels of light, uh, as they call them in Asia. Vortexes which interpenetrate these different energy fields. And it seems there are seven basic ones, of foundation ones, many others but foundation ones, going up through the, the human form and, and this one is the key, the heart. This vortex connects us to way out there, to far higher, more expanded levels of awareness um, than any, anything else. And uh, the organization, there's an organization in America, it's called the Institute of Heart Math. And they Uh, research the power of the heart. Heart math. Yeah. yeah. Sounds good. And <laughs> they, they have, they've been doing it for a long time now, they have found that the most powerful electromagnetic field in the body field of electromagnetic fields is the heart. There are more nerves going from the heart to the brain than coming the other way. Mm -hmm. And that when the heart um, energetic field is in what they call coherence, in other words, balance, and connects in coherence with the central nervous system and the brain, that trinity, if you like, when it comes into harmony, takes some, the person into a much higher level of awareness and consciousness. Mm -hmm. The key is the coherence of the heart field. Once you knock that out, you knock everything out, and what's left then as the arbiter and decider of reality? This. Now this is a great servant to this. Mm -hmm. It's not a great master when it's in control of our perception of reality. And. There's another vortex in the belly, which is about emotions. It's, this is why when people feel nervous or frightened, they feel, they feel it in the belly. 
um, oh, and, and you know they need to go to the toilet. It's because the imbalance caused by the fear and nervousness in the sh- in the chakra, the vortex, linked to emotions, um, is affecting the balance or imbalancing in the same way the the intestinal system and and what have you. Um, and what they've done to pull humanity into a low vibrational brain dominated perception is they've moved the point where we interact with reality from the heart to the belly. Hmm. They've done it genetically because as I said in my last book, remember who you are, I'm saying that on the level of human DNA that they call junk DNA, which is anything up to 98% non-coding DNA, um, they call it junk DNA because they don't know what it does. Well, some cutting edge scientists, not least in uh, in Russia and, and some in America, uh, are pointing out that actually within so-called junk or non-coding DNA is a language and it's a very... Um, uh, it's a language that you can you can see and you can uh, uncover, and it operates very much like human language. It has m- many of the very closely the traits of how human language is sequenced. This is how this language, as they call it, within so-called junk DNA, is sequenced. And they're talking about the fact that the human language, which is what vibrational fields that's what it is we hear the words but only when the brain decodes them Mm -hmm. what's passing between me and you now is not the words and what people are hearing what's passing between me and everybody is not words it's a vibrational information field generated by my vocal cords Mm -hmm. people are only hearing the words when they decode that information so everything is vibrational waveform at its base even language DNA is waveform, like the body is waveform in its base, in its base uh, state. And they're starting to uncover this language, and it fits absolutely my contention that part of this genetic manipulation was to put into junk DNA what I call biological software programs, and they are basically perception programs so if you put a disk into a computer and the computer starts to read it on the screen the computer's symbolic perception Hmm. is read from the disk well what if we had biological software programs running through from junk dna this language they find they're finding and we were reading them into a perception of reality. The other key side of this is that there are emotional biological software programs in there that are running all the time. And when you uh, are reading those, then you are in the belly because they're, 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 they're... low vibrational software programs in terms of emotions because they're all about fear and all the subdivisions of fear like anxiety and frustration and and, and depression and uh, guilt all these expressions different expressions of fear um, and if you do if we do not open our minds I call this the human body mind computer biological computer if we don't open our minds and let the true self in consciousness then humans are operating literally in a closed system in which the DNA emotional and perception programs are running and not being challenged by a a level of awareness that is beyond the program so basically, people talk about the blind leading the blind. Mm. What humans are is the program leading the program. Mm-hmm. And 
it is my view, and this, this may be shocking to people, um, even some who have been along this road a bit, it's my view after 22 years of putting this together, that the vast majority, at least, of humans have been going through entire lifetimes without having a single original thought or emotional response. Now, when you've got psychologists, I mean, Cole Young, the Swiss psychiatrist, talked about this, but others too. When you've got psychologists that say that they can break down the human personality into 12 major archetypes and combinations of them, well, at the level of awareness, at the level of consciousness, at the level of the true self, we are infinite possibility within an infinite reality of infinite possibility. How on earth can you break down that into 12 major archetypes and combinations of them? It's ludicrous. You can't. But what can you do that to? Computer programs. Hmm. And that's what, that's what, that's what we are. This, these archetypal personalities are actually software running, perception software, running within junk DNA. Now, put all this together, and that has moved us from a heart-centered society, connected out into a greater level of reality. This is the innate intelligence. This is supposed to serve this, not be the governor of perception. That's why this knows, and this thinks has to work it out. People don't go, um, my intuition thinks, no, my intuition, and we do this, don't we? My intuition just knows, knows, because instinctively on a subconscious level, we're going to that point of true um, knowledge, true awareness, not beyond knowledge, this is knowledge awareness. Um, but what's happened is it's, our point of interacting has gone from the heart-centered society and if you're coming from this, and this innate awareness, this innate knowing, this innate understanding that everything is connected to everything else, then you create, manifest from that, a completely different society to the one that we have. What's the one that we have? <coughs> They've moved it into the belly. Humans now, <coughs> gold. I've got a cough. <laughs> it's not the cough that carries you off. It's the coughing that carries you off. <laughs> now, they've moved it into a belly society. Where does human response come from, overwhelmingly, to events that we face? The emotions. It's an emotional response. It's an emotional reaction. It's not a heart reaction, overwhelmingly, though, of course, it does happen. It's, a, it's an emotional reaction. You know, this uh, mass manipulation technique that I called a long time ago problem, reaction, solution, where they create the problem covertly, tell the people through an unquestioning mainstream media the version of the problem they want people to believe, <laughs> and then they get the reaction from the people, do something, do something, something must be done, and then they who have covertly created the problem, got that reaction, do something, then at stage three, openly offer the solution to the problems um, that they have created, which gives them the excuse to change society and advance the agenda that, that, that they're following. Now, it's not problem, go into the heart, look at it from the innate intelligence of the heart. It's not even problem, have a think about it, do a bit of research, see what you think. Mm. It's problem, reaction, mm. solution. It's the manipulation of an emotional response, an emotional reaction. And, and what they're doing all the time is manipulating uh, an emotional response to get support or to justify what they're doing. Um, so, for instance, they'll, um, they'll tell you that uh, Gaddafi was killing his own people and, and what have you, because they're looking for an emotional response. Oh, no, we've got to stop him killing his own people. What they don't tell you, of course, is that the rebels 
were actually put in there, funded and armed by, by the NATO alliance mm. to cause the problem. And then when Gaddafi's troops start reacting to what they're doing, um, uh, shooting back at being shot at, then suddenly, oh, look, Gaddafi's mm. killing his own people. Reaction, oh, oh yeah, we've got to stop it. So this is happening all the time. You know, 9-11, ooh, that was, what, look at 9-11. And those horrific pictures and, and, and the towers coming down. Did that, did that take us to here? No, it took people here. And from this gut, what would you say? Gut reaction. You know how many what, you know, how you, people say, what does your heart tell you? What does your heart tell you? Right? But how many times, instead of going, what does your heart tell you? What do we say? What does your gut tell you? Mm -hmm. Emotional response, emotional reaction. And so what they've done is moved us not all of us, not everybody, but, you know, the vast majority. They've yeah. moved them from the heart. High vibration, which they can't touch. Yeah. If we're in the heart, we're untouchable. It's like Radio 1 trying to impact on Radio 2. Can't be done. They're terrified of us going into the heart uh, because it's over. Um, so they move us into their stadium vibrationally. Because not only do they manipulate human response through... Um, emotion. They feed off human low vibrational emotional energy. They've turned us into their energy source because they're an energetic source basically at that at their core. Well, we all are, but they're much uh, more energetic than we are because we, we're, we're much more aware of the holographic, the so called physical. Um, and so when we, when we eat food, we think we're eating physical food. There is no physical. We're eating holographic food. But the foundation of that food, which we decode into some kind of illusory solidity, is actually a waveform information field. All that these entities do is they feed, they, they get their energy source, not from a sandwich and a cup of tea, but directly, energetically, they absorb energy in its uh, waveform. And so when we generate low vibrational human emotion, that emotion is resonating within the frequency. That's why we can't see it. We can feel emotion, but we can't see it. Um, because it's vibrating within another frequency band beyond visible light. And that's the frequency band that these archons, reptilians, um, overwhelmingly operate in. So every time we generate fear and all its offshoots, we're feeding them energetically. So you get a, a war, a 9-11, a global war, and it's uh, you get an economic crisis where parents now in Greece are giving their children away or selling their children because they can't afford to feed them. Can you imagine in that one incident with one uh, set of parents how much is generated here emotionally from the horrific, I can't even think about it, imagine what it must be like. Um, and that's just two parents. You get that operating. Look at the world. Look at the world every day. All over the world, in all these different expressions, how emotional energy is being generated and, 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 and produced by the circumstances that society has been structured to create. It's, a, it's, it's, it's an orgy of energetic vampiring. When Morpheus in the Matrix held up a battery and said, the Matrix is a computer-generated dream world made to turn humans into one of these. That is a profound truth, because that's what we've become. Not so much batteries, though that was a good symbol, mm -hmm. but actually generators, power stations, generating this energy. So we have this situation, if we bring these strands together at this point, in, in my contention, that these perception programs are running through junk DNA and the emotional software programs, biological software programs, are running through uh, non-coding junk DNA. 
And as those programs uh, are running, and as society is structured so that it generates situations, in computer terms, data, that trigger those programs and bring them to the surface where they're more uh, impacting upon our behavior and responses. Um, you are A, locking humanity into this closed system where the program programs the program, and you're also pulling people from the heart, high vibration, down into low vibrational belly uh, emotional vortex, which is pulling humanity into the predator's vibrational stadium. And in doing so, they are able to trawl and vampire the energy that that emotional state and response is constantly generating. Now, I've talked for a long time from your question, what can we do? Because that background, I suggest, was fundamentally necessary. So what do we do? What can we do? It might sound straight, uh, tr trite and, 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 and all the rest of it. I mean, because what we've got to do, of course, is we've got to stockpile weapons. Um, we've got to um, create uh, human armies to fight against them. And we've uh, basically got to try to do all the things to them that they do to us, right? And where does that take us? First of all, it makes us them. And secondly, if we go down that road, A, we'll do what? We'll produce more and more and more of this low vibrational emotional energy um, in, the, in, the, in the hatred and in the, um, uh, the anger that we produce. And... We will also, if we go down that road, um, we will have, symbolically, um, weapons that manifest as a pop gun against state-of-the-art weaponry. So, although it's very macho and very, we've got to fight. I love Tony Blair once, he said, we've got to fight for peace. <laughs> Sorry, can I just have some time to work that out in a darkened room, please? Um, and it, it is something that, when you look at it, is very good for the, the matcha we've got to fight in. But as a strategy of bringing this down, it is doomed to failure and disaster. Because it's playing the game they want us to play. And... If you're in that macho mode and you think the whole spiritual side of things and stuff like that is namby-pamby, airy-fairy and a bit, you know, soft, then what I'm going to say will make no sense. But if we are going to bring an end to something that has been created and perpetuated by something happening then we can fight that something or we can remove that something and if you've got your finger in um, you know a boiling pan of water well you can uh, you can turn the gas off or you can, you can literally take your finger out. In other words, instead of finding a solution to the problem, turning the gas off, not really a solution, your finger's still in there, you remove the cause of the problem. The cause of your problem burning in the water is because your finger's in the frickin' water. So remove it. Done. And if you look at any situation that we want to change, you will always find that removing what has caused the problem is always far more effective than finding a solution to the problem that you've caused. And so, we have this 
control system. We have this constant and gathering, expanding imposition and dismantling of people's lives financially in all these different ways. And we can say the solution is to fight the system and get out on the streets and fight and, and all this stuff. Or we can say, what has caused this reality that we are experiencing? So why not remove, uh, remove the cause of the problem? And this is not about fighting. It's not about macho man responses. It's not about shouting loud. It's about changing the way that we interact with reality. And in doing so, stepping out of the influence of the programs that have been running human perception and emotional response throughout known human history and are creating the world that we live in. Because If I go back to what the Gnostics said about the Archons, they have no creative energy. They can't make things happen. But we can. We can, yes. Which is bringing us to an interesting point. We can manifest. What this manipulative force has done as program humans to use that gift of manifestation to manifest what they want. And so if we manifest from our perceptions of reality, then manipulate their perception of reality and they'll manifest what you've manipulated them to perceive as reality. So I see people challenging war and conflict when their own lives are full of conflict. Now we live in a holographic reality at this conscious mind level and there's a very unique and fascinating trait that and characteristic of holograms and holographic reality. Every part of the whole is a smaller version of the whole. So if you take, for instance, in the holograms that you buy in the shops, if you take the waveform holographic print, which is on the print in waveform information, and you cut it in four, and you fire the laser which brings the, reads that information in effect, and brings the three-dimensional holographic image projecting from the waveform information uh, on the photographic print. If you cut that into four and put a laser to the each four pieces, you will not get a quarter of the whole picture. You'll get four quarter size versions of the whole picture. And this is why, uh, or explains, why alternative forms of healing like um, reflexology and acupuncture and others can find points on the ear and the feet and the hands and all different parts of the body that relate to the body as a whole. Thus reflexologists can um, work on a part of the foot and impact upon the heart or the liver depending on where they're doing it. And, and I know, I've known and talked to reflexologists and people like that over the years and they know it works, but they're not sure why it works or why there are points on the foot and the ear and everything that relate and impact upon. Oh, well, it's sim simple when you realize that, the, that this reality is holographic because every part of the whole um, is a smaller version of the whole. The body is a holographic uh, uh, manifestation, it's a hologram. Thus, every part of the body must be a smaller version of the whole. And that's why all over the body, in all the different parts, you can find points that relate to the whole body. In the same way, 
if we have conflict in our own lives on a so-called individual level, and this is going on all over the world in all these different societies, I mean, and it is, um, then that's a smaller version of the whole. And a hologram moves both ways. When the whole hologram shifts, all the parts of the hologram shift, because they're expressions of each other. You shift or affect the smaller part of the hologram, and in this case, it's lots of people, billions of people with conflict in their lives, and all that stuff, and that's going to impact on the hologram as a whole, i.e. human society. And you're going to have collective conflict. If we want to put the fire out of the whole, what we call human society and global experience, then we have to put the fire out in our own lives because we are fueling the fire. We are creating the fire. This is why they want conflict and disruption uh, at all levels of society because they know that they're constantly impacting upon each other. We have conflict in our own lives. Collectively, we are manifesting collective conflict. You have collective conflict, like bombing uh, uh, Libya and, 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 and Iraq and what have you, and the global conflicts. Those collective conflicts then impact on the individual that, that, that uh, reacts to them uh, with a lot more emotional, belly-based um, emotion, uh, emotional response. So, so everything is connected to everything else. Everything's impacting on everything else. Now, those behind this manipulation of human society, they know that. And they have been playing humans like a violin for so long. And this is why, well, not the only reason, not the only reason, but this is why they created human religions in, in this part of why, because there were many whys for that, and why they created uh, human science, which, which is, I call it Stone Age science, it's song sheet science, it's, it's not science, it's just a, a, a bogus explanation for reality, so we don't see the real one. This is why the nature of reality is, is hardly, if any, any time, discussed in schools or, 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 or education in general. Um, and, and, you know, I travel around the world. I've been to 50-odd countries, uh, many of them many times. I've seen the streams of television channels, not least places like America. You're going through the zapper button, and there's channels after channels after channels. I have never seen one that was asking the question with an open mind, who are we, where are we, what is reality? Now that is ludicrous. I mean, we have a situation where probably the vast majority of people go through a lifetime, until they come to the end of their lives and they're thinking, you know, where do you go? Who don't even think about who am I? You know, you say to them, who are you? Oh, I'm Charlie Jones. I drive a bus. And they'll tell you your fa family history. They'll tell you their life history and, 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 and all that stuff. That's not them. That's their experience. Um, and, and human self-identity identifies who we are, self, with our experience, with our name, with our job. Um, who are you? I, 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 I'm a banker. No, that's your experience. It's not who you are. And so, um, when you um, lose touch with who you are, and you lose connection to the true self beyond the, the program, then what's left is for the program to run and dominate our sense of reality. Our sense of reality becomes our point of observation by which we judge everything, and the emotional reaction from which our judgment and response to events comes. And it's a closed, ever-repeating um, cycle. And uh, unless we break it, then this will go on. And we break it 
by moving our point of attention, the point at which we interact with the world from there to here. And, you know, I had some amazing experiences in Peru um, in 1991. Amazing experiences which changed my life and all the rest of it. And I went back to Peru with a, a group of people from all over the world in April 2012 and we went around Peru and we went to Machu Picchu and this place where I had my amazing paranormal what extraordinary experience in 1991 called Si Ustani near a place called Puno and Lake Titicaca the highest number of lake in the world and this group all of us were going around these places and what these places were were heart places mm -hmm. when you went there you interacted with them from here and the behavior of the group and the demeanor of the group was laughter and joy and, and, and happiness. Then there was one day, and this really, you know, I've been aware of all this for a long time, but so, you, know, you know what it's like. Sometimes you have an experience and it goes bang mm. in your face. And there was one day towards the end of the trip well, we went to a place called Kiwaneku, just over the border in Bolivia. It's an ancient site, very famous ancient site. If you look at the, the history and accounts of, um, of South America. And if anyone thinks that human awareness, human emotion, human demeanor does not impact upon the energy field that we're all interacting with. They should cross the border between Peru and Bolivia at this place where we did. You walked across a, mm. a, a bridge, across a river, and mm. one side was Peru and the other side was <laughs> Bolivia. So once you cross into Bolivia, whoo, doom, ah, this. You're right? back. So <laughs> it took ages to get through the, um, the border guards. Um, just for a tourist group who's going to be in the country for about three hours. They'd all just come back from a, a hospital, apparently, where they'd had a, a sense of humour bypass. <laughs> and, and, um, and we headed to this Kiwanaku, going through in a 40-minute drive, through um, a police checkpoint and a military checkpoint. You know, I mean, if anyone, if anyone says that he's predicting that... Um, Bolivia is going to be a police state. Well, you're too late, mate. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we get there. And it was horrible, Kiwanaku. It was big time here, right? And um, I felt this in many places around the world, and they've all been connected to human sacrifice and uh, rituals involving these entities operating in other, other levels of reality, but interacting with this one. This is what satanic rituals are. Um, they're the interaction. This is why they do certain things and repeat them. They're creating an energetic environment which allows interaction and, and even the manifestation of these entities within the rituals. This is what sacrificing to the gods was all about in the ancient world. Um, because when um, you sacrifice someone, the, the people doing the sacrifice, they drink the blood and eat the flesh, which is what this old Christ, uh, Roman Catholic thing is really about. <laughs> drinking the blood of Jesus and eating the flesh, that's just a mild bloody cover for what goes on in the background. Right. But on the other levels of reality while this is going on, these entities perceived as the gods are feeding off the terror of the victim. Right? This, this is sacrifice to the gods. Anyway, we get to Kiwanaku and it was that kind of energy. Ooh. But what I noticed was the demeanor of the group changed. Hmm. People weren't happy. They... Um, they were not in a good space. And there was this lovely guy, um, Mark, a lovely Irish guy. And um, the, the, the change in the behavior of the group was so pronounced that on the way back, which we got back into Peru, where everyone started getting a bit happy again, um, <laughs> I asked people if they wanted to go on the microphone or the bus and explain you know, their experience. And Mark um, said, and Mark was a lovely, lovely guy, all laughing and dancing and all the rest of it, all the way through Peru. And he said, when I was at Kiwanaku, he said, I just wanted to shout abuse at anyone that got in my way when I was trying to take a picture. And I, you know, I just felt so different. And 
I won't labor the point, but having, you know, seen it and experienced it and seeing the re response, you could see Peru, what a world that would be. And then Kiwanaku, the world that we have today. And we really got to move to here. And I would say to people, it's a challenge in this world. Because everything, virtually everything in this world is designed to push you here. Hmm. So when, you've, when you're responding from, from a, uh, a belly emotional point of view, just, and you can do it with your mind, with your consciousness, you just move, it, it is not, it's moving your point of attention. That's what it is. You move your point of attention and you, you move it here and, 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 and feel that point of attention here, not here, and you'll see the situation you face. I know because I've done it myself and I've um, talked to others about doing it and they have and they say, yes, it does work. You get to bring it to here. A situation that you're facing looks very different here to here and vice versa. This is what we need to go. We need to become the heart-centered society that we are being hijacked and manipulated out of. Now, it's not just about moving your point of attention here and, and, and seeing the situation from here. Once you move your point of attention here, the vortex opens. Because now you're interacting with it, with your own awareness, instead of interacting in a way that's dominated by this emotion. And when that opens, what comes through that energetic channel is innate intelligence, innate insight, innate knowing. And suddenly you're seeing the world and getting insights into things and you're seeing what is happening as it is and not as this is programmed to see it. And this is programmed to see it. You see, the, the, the brain isolated from the heart works in unison with the emotional chakra and these two in unison crikey they're a bloody nightmare look at everything about human society that you don't like these two buggers working in unison are where it comes from so this there. You see this i'm talking about these emotional and perception programs that I say are running through junk DNA. Once the heart is no longer impacting in any way significantly on our sense of uh, perception, on our sense of reality and all the rest of it, our sense of response, then the brain becomes the governor of our what? Perception, which is dictated to the brain once this is out of the way, which, which can override those bloody programs running through junk DNA, piece of cake, you know, this is where the power is, this is what they're terrified of. Um, so once that's closed down, this is what's done by the program and the way society is structured, then um, this becomes the governor of perception. And what it is doing, it is um, decoding as a sense of perception, the perception programs running through junk DNA. And that perception uh, of something becomes an emotional response to something and this is an emotional response from the programs running through junk DNA of the, of, of the emotional programs. So here's your, your, if you like, your holographic manifestation of the um, perception programs of self and the world and reality running through and here is your holographic expression in, in, in response and reaction of the, of the emotional programs running through junk DNA. And these have created the world we don't like. They've created the ability of the few to dictate to the vast majority. Because this will never see it. This will never get it. Uh, except up to a point. This um, can get to a point where it can see the names, dates, places, um, Bilderberg group level of engineered wars level of what's going on in the world but seeing where that is coming from what's behind it 
you've got to go in here. Because if you don't, you can't get into the rabbit hole. Because this can only go so far. And it's my view, and uh, in my experience anyway, that if you are an expert in 9-11, in engineered wars, engineered banking scams, manipulated political nonsense, then you are still walking around the outer rim of the rabbit hole. You've not even entered it yet. Because... It's still the movie. This holographic reality is like a holographic movie. And when a movie has hit the screen, that's it. It's a done deal. You ain't got to change the movie now. And that's what this world is, this holographic world. Um, because what the human body computer is doing is taking vibrational waveform information, which is what the five senses do, it's turning it into electrical information, same information, different form, and it communicates that to the brain and the whole genetic structure, in fact, and that decodes it through into the, um, the digital and then the holographic. So the holographic, this apparently physical world, is the end of the story. That, in movie terms, is the movie hitting the screen. You ain't going to change it. You won't stand up in front of a movie screen and start shouting at the screen and telling the movie to change, will you? You'll go, people will go, you're mad, mate, you're mad. <laughs> you want to change the movie, you've got to change the real. It's being projected from back here. Hmm. Um, and, but that's what we're doing. You know, in so many ways that people respond to this conspiracy when they meet it at some level. It's, we must get out of the streets and protest. Well, I'm not saying don't. But that's still trying to change the movie when the movies hit the screen. If you come back and go deeper in the rabbit hole and you understand where this movie is being projected from, which is from other um, frequency bands of reality through the Illuminati families and the Illuminati structure within visible light human society to, to, to become the movie we call human society then you can go back to the point it's coming from and therefore you can change what's coming. You can change the movie. And that's what we need to do. And to do that, you know, those that... And I'm not knocking the five sense level of the conspiracy and communicating it, 9-11, manipulate... I'm doing it every day on my website. The books are full of it. We need to know that. But if we only do that, then basically we are seeing the outcome. We are not seeing the origin. And you cannot change an outcome without changing the origin. Uh, when I look at so much uh, conspiracy research, good luck to them. You know, everybody that comes and does this, hallelujah to you. Good, good on you. But there comes a point where we, we, we know how the system works in the holographic world. I mean, what's left? Finding out what size shoes Henry Kissinger takes. Yes, on a daily basis as it unfolds, we need to, you know, keep with it. But, okay. But, are we going to become recorders of our own enslavement? Oh, see, I told you they'd do this next. Look, they're doing it. If we do that, we've moved from not knowing that the prison's being built around us to seeing the prison being built around us. But there's a common theme between the two of them. The prison's being built around us. And that's fine if people want to do that only, I'm not saying don't do it, but, but to do it only and ignore where it's coming from, therefore the solution or the removing the cause of the problem. We, the, the people who only do that, will record and record and record and record their own gathering enslavement and the enslavement of humanity until we wake up. Would you come with me, sir? I, I, I ain't waiting for that. I want, I, I, we need to change where it's coming from. And for that, 
there are some major challenges for those in the conspiracy research arena who are dominated by a sense of patriotism and dominated by a sense of a religion. Because patriotism in the sense of, I'm not saying don't you know, love your country and love your culture, not, nothing like that. But patriotism in the sense of self-identity, I am an American, I am an American pat. No! That is your experience. What you are is infinite awareness. All that is, has been and ever can be. All possibility. Having that experience. And I'm a Christian. No, you're not. That's the belief system you have chosen to take on as your persona. But it's an experience of being a Christian. It is not who you are. And apparently and historically opposed the secret society, the secret oath, and the secret proceedings. We decided long ago the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment. Of pertinent facts far outweigh the dangers which are cited to justify it. Face the facts, join our hands, make a stand. Uh -huh. It's time to gather plans, get the shot, take the chance. Till there is no one left, stay correct to the death. They can't ever break a freedom, we will never let it. The corrupt politics is killing the system. Cynicism is it, and it's everything that you witness. They tell you what to think, make you believe that they're the realness. They feed us full of lies, and yet we always forgive them. Huh? It's all conspiracy, and if you feed an inner witch, you're the puppet. The government's pulling strings from above you. It's time for the introduction to truth, and let's start a movement. We've all been brainwashed, they believe that we all are stupid. We believe in what we see, and whatever our ears are hearing. But if you look close, listen, gather your own opinion, you'll understand all the lies, lines, and what's between them. This world is not your oyster, this world is a fucking prison. Come on! happening in our nation. The world will stand up for the fear of assassination. So they strip us of everything. We stand there and just take it. We're scared to make a stand a false flag operation. Research Illuminati. Find out by 9-11. You see they line their pockets. Don't believe the lies they tell you. Find to see the truth. Realize we need to do whatever it is we can to protect our livelihood. It's time for us to do whether conspiracy or not. They owe some explanations to the questions that we got. What are the skull and bones? What is lying beneath all these secretive meats? Got you lying between your teeth. What's with the Bilderberg? I'm burning your effigies. I'm praying a Lucifer. How sickness can you be? While all of the time praying you believing in the beast. Just to keep up appearances within Christianity. Come on. Sheep in the night. 